Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. On today's video, I would like to give a book report on a very, very interesting book because it's a very interesting and pertinent subject. The name of the book is On the Road to Armageddon. And this book was written by Timothy P. Weber. And Weber is spelled with one B, Timothy P. Weber. This book is concerning how evangelicals became Israel's best friend. Now, we know that in this modern evangelical world in which we live, the modern church, at least the evangelical wing of the modern church, has gone completely full force in supporting the state of Israel and proclaiming that the Jews are God's chosen people, etc. So therefore, there's a lot of flag-waving of the six-pointed star. You see these flags in churches. You see them on bumper stickers. You can see them uh, in these big rallies, you know, Israel first and a night for Israel and so forth. But what is the truth behind all of that? Has the evangelical world just gone absolutely mad? I know that they say that they base all their beliefs on the Bible and on Bible prophecy. But what is the interpretation of their prophecy? That's what matters. So when I begin to see all this take place, and all the hoopla about the Jews having a special place in God's kingdom, a better place, higher place, more prominent place than all the, quote, Gentiles, I begin to wonder, what is this all about? So I want to give a, an overview of this book, On the Road to Armageddon. Now. We do not handle this book. We do not sell this book. Um, this is my only copy. So therefore, it is still available, maybe Amazon or somewhere like that. You can, you can find this book. It's well worth the reading. And there's approximately 200 and... 65 reading words, or 65 reading pages, I should say. And then there's uh, footnotes at the back. Um, it's well worth it. It's an important subject. And I could uh, speak about these things, but I wanted to give a source, an authoritative source for a lot of these beliefs and practices that are going on in the evangelical world. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 16 and 17, it says, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment and the tent or the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. In a beginning review of this book, and I'm going to remove this dust cover for now, 
On page 11, the author lays out some concepts of different groups going back well over a hundred years, because what these groups were called is millennialist groups, groups that taught that Jesus is going to come and set up an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem. And all the Jews are going to be, quote, born again, and they're going to become flamey, flaming evangelists for Christ and so forth. So uh, they also believed, some of them believed, in some of the great historical revivals that took place in America, that it was the beginning of the Christianization of the whole world. The church would just get stronger and stronger. All of them did not believe that. But there was the United Society of the Believers with Mother Ann Lee, and they were commonly known as the Shakers. Also, John Humphrey Knows was a group. Uh, he was a convert of Charles Finney, and they had some weird ideas concerning complex marriage. And then a more popular, well-known group was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Book of Mormon, and Joseph Smith, as we all uh, remember him. Then William Miller in 1843, he was a Baptist preacher from Vermont who began to preach um, a message, and he calculated that Jesus was going to come in 1843. And this turned out to be what is called the Great Disappointment. And as a result of that, Many of the Millerites accepted Ellen G. White in her prophecies and her calculations, and they started the Seventh day Adventist Church. Now, the next one is Charles Taz Russell, and he started the Watchtower magazine turned out to be the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have also set dates as for the coming of Christ. I'm just hitting the highlights to let you know that there were many that went before this modern evangelical element of the church that set dates concerning the time of Christ's return, etc. And then also, Another movement emerged in the 1870s of dispensationalism, which uh, actually originated four decades earlier in Great Britain with John Nelson Darby. He was a, a, a disgruntled priest from the Anglican Church of Ireland. He was with the Plymouth Brethren, and then it came over here. He traveled over here to the United States in the 1870s. And he, along with others, influenced Schofield, C.I. Schofield, to publish his Schofield Reference Bible in 1909. And in that Bible, the Jews he taught, would have to reestablish their own state in the Holy Land, and without a restored Jewish state, there could be no Antichrist, no Great Tribulation, no Battle of Armageddon, no Second Coming. In fact, everything was riding on the Jews. So that's when this dispensationalism really got started. 
but it had its origin in some of these other groups. But it really got started with the Schofield Reference Bible and John Nelson Darby and dispensationalism. And then there's other groups that have come along since then. And, you know, we've all heard of uh, the Branch Davidians. They set dates. They were, you know, in a commune waiting for the coming of Christ, that, that type of thing. Um, also in 1997, 39 members of the Heaven's Gate in San Diego also were looking for the coming of Christ. Didn't happen, as we all know, they committed suicide. Um, also, what this book is about, and I'll, I'll, I will outline it very shortly, very quickly. The first chapter explains what dispen dispensationalism is and how it came to America and why some evangelicals found it so appealing. Chapter 2 discusses why dispensationalists never acted like their critics said they should. That's kind of an interesting thing. Chapter 3 examines how well dispensationalists did at interpreting the signs of the times, and they're still doing that. Chapter 4 goes to the central part of the story. Even before organized Zionism, dispensationalists advocated a Jewish state in the Middle East. And then chapter 5, while dispensationalists believe that Jews in the future would play an essential role in end-time events, their relationship with Jews in the present was yet complicated and even controversial. And there's where it gets into the areas of, quote, anti-Semitism. That's a very interesting chapter. Chapter 6 traces dispensationalist reactions to the emergence of the new Jewish state and its expansion two decades later. Chapter 7 tells the story of dispensationalism's breakthrough into new markets after 1970, which became as the new Christian right. And every Christian should know the origin of the new Christian right. Do they have everything wrong? No, they don't. But do they speak for me? On every subject? Absolutely not, because they are rabid Zionists. And also, we must put an emphasis of understanding on dispensationalism. That's the key, that's the beginning. Because dispensationalism, whereas John Nelson Darby took the Bible and divided it up into seven different eras or periods of time, and that's why they call it dispensationalism. And that caught on like a uh, a wildfire. It, it caught on like a, a prairie fire in, in Kansas in the high wind. I mean, it just got into every segment of evangelical Christianity in America. It got into the Baptist, the Methodist, the Pentecostals, and they carried the ball of that interpretation that everything was riding on the Jews going back to Jerusalem. So 
about this same time, Schofield, he writes the notes to his Bible. And there was a man by the name of A.C. Gabeline that helped him. He was a German. He was non-Jewish. But he was on board with Schofield because he actually had a mission towards uh, the, in, in Jewish communities to try to convert him to Christ. And he helped, plus others helped. And it was financed, this, the publishing of the Schofield Bible. Some people believe that it was actually financed by Jewish organizations because it promoted their point of view. And all these things are brought out in this book. This book needs to be read by every Christian living today for they will know and understand what they are listening to when they sit in the pews of their churches or sit on their couch and listen to some telev televangelist talk about the Jews going back and Bible prophecy being fulfilled. They need to know, instead of just sitting there like a potato head, non-thinking, totally ignorant, of history, and they just accept it, and then they get out their wallet and begin to uh, deal out all this cash for the state of Israel and the Jews that are getting four billion dollars a year from the United States government in foreign aid. But these television evangelists are smooth talkers, and I wonder how much actually goes to the cause for which they are uh, promoting. Well, it also has a lot to do, this, the state of Israel uh, also has a lot to do with the concept of the rapture. Now, we know that the rapture doctrine uh, is not true, it's not biblical, and they came up with this concept uh, interpreting 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, and Darby capitalized on this, and also Schofield, coupled with the visions of a young woman in Glasgow, Scotland, by the name of Margaret MacDonald. She saw this vision of people flying away and being caught away in the sky. Well, I'm just giving a brief, very brief overview of this subject. But somebody that really wants to know the truth needs to read this book. And that's why I'm uh, recommending this book. You may ask, well, how did it catch on? How did this rapture, uh, Jews going back to Israel, how did it catch on so fast? Well, there was a group of men that got together and they started a Bible conference in the mid-1870s. And they organized it at a permanent site at Niagara-on-the-Lake in Ontario, Canada. And Later on, it was just called the Niagara Bible Conference. And they promoted this. The big names of the church world came and attended these conferences, and they were asked to speak. 
And these ideas, these new ideas that had been put into Christianity began to be discussed. And a lot of them caught on because they said, well, maybe that does mean a catching away. Maybe Paul was referring to the saints flying away to another planet. So the big names in Christianity began to be influenced, and a lot of them uh, were persuaded of the new doctrines. Uh, there was a prophetic conference held in New York in 1878, and they lasted for several years. And some of the big names, as I mentioned before, in Christianity, and maybe you've heard some of them. I know you've heard of D.L. Moody. Um, he got on board with this evangelical uh, concept of dispensationalism and also that the Jews had to go back to Israel. And the idea caught on so fast, it got into Sunday school literature, adult Sunday school classes, and unlearned Sunday school teachers picked up on this because it was easy just to read a, a Sunday school quarterly and, you know, boy, this sounds good. So they told their class. And that was through uh, 1900 coming this way through the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And um, so there we have it. And the turning the pages here, it goes into more depth concerning Gabeline, Schofield. It gives a wonderful, wonderful uh, overview of the whole story. Now, as we come to page 71, This became a big issue, Gog and Magog. And it was not until the 19th century that students of Bible prophecy started interpreting Gog as Russia. And much of the credit goes to a man by the name of Wilhelm Jesenius a German Hebrew scholar um, whose Old Testament lexicon of 1828 read Rosh, R-O-S-H, as Russia, and Meshek as Moscow, and Tubal as Tobosh. So some people interested in Bible prophecy might be helped in knowing this information, where this came from. Well, C.I. Schofield picked up on it. Darby picked up on it. So this scholar, this man, Timothy Weber, has done the homework for us. That's why I am sh sharing this with you. And also, they began to interpret uh, Bible prophecy concerning the Antichrist. Who was the Antichrist? Well, it was Mussolini. That's what the dispensationalists said. It was Mussolini. Well, he wound up hanging upside down from a street sign or a light pole or something. So he was not the Antichrist. Well, Adolf Hitler 
See, they always are looking for a future Antichrist because they do not properly understand the 70 weeks of Daniel. So the 70 weeks of Daniel is where these evangelical dispensational futurists went in the ditch. So they have to have an Antichrist. Well, Hitler didn't work out, so look for someone else. Oh, some of them said it was FDR. Well, maybe they're getting warm. Um, but you see, they're always looking for an Antichrist and also looking to set dates for the coming of Christ. Some people said that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. Some said JFK was the Antichrist. Others have said that the Antichrist was a Jew. Some said, no, he's not a Jew. He's Indian from the country of India. And he is already alive, a young man being groomed. All that is speculation, folks. That's from the futurist. That's from those who don't understand Bible prophecy. Well, as we go on through this book, the origins of Zionism. Now, as far back as 1850, Mr. Weber names one, two, three Jewish scholars who said that the Jews have a right to the Holy Land. And in the 1880s, this is a very important part of history, there was Jewish persecution in Russia, what they called pogroms. And these pogroms were so brutal that the Jews reacted with what they called Jewish nationalism. It was a reaction. They were being oppressed. Some of them lost their jobs. Some of them were murdered, killed. As a reaction, they said, well, we need to have a sense of nationalism among ourselves. So that was in the 1880s, 1890s, and then modern Judaism is somewhat a result of that. Reform Judaism. They said, well, we could, we could reform our religion and blend in with the greater society, the greater culture. We could, we could blend in with it if we change our religion. So that, that is mentioned in this book. And on page 99, Mr. Weber says, a new wave of Jewish immigrants overwhelmed this small but stable Sephardic population. There was the Sephardic Jews that came to America. And then he says between 1820 and 1880, as many as 400,000 German Jews or Ashkenazim came to America. Um, so here they began to come to this country to get away from the pogroms of Russia and Poland and the, those Eastern European countries. A third wave of Jewish immigrants 
overwhelmed the German Jewish establishment. Between 1880 and the outbreak of World War I, when immigration law changed to a quota system, 1.7 million Jews came to America. They were Russian, Romanian, Polish, Bulgarian, etc. So there's where we see they came into Ellis Island. A lot of them stayed right there. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So that was more or less the beginning of Zionism. When the Jews came over here, they were looking for a, quote, homeland, but yet they didn't have the Holy Land to go to at that time. But there were uh, different men in this country that were promoting the idea of them going back over there to uh, the so-called Holy Land. But I earlier I mentioned this man, A.C. Gabeline, who helped Schofield write his prophecy notes in his Bible. And Gabeline was a Christian man. He was wrong on his prophecy, but he was a Christian man. And this is what he wrote. Zionism is not the divinely promised restoration of Israel. Zionism is not the fulfillment of the large number of predictions found in the Old Testament, which relate to Israel's return to the land. Indeed, Zionism has very little use for arguments from the Word of God. It is rather a political and philanthropic undertaking. Instead of coming together before God, calling upon His name, trusting Him that He is able to perform that which He often promised, they speak about their riches and their influence, their colonial bank, and court the favor of the Sultan. The great movement is one of unbelief and confidence in themselves instead of God's eternal purposes. Well, another man that played a major part in the Jews going back, and that is a man by the name of William E. Blackstone. He was from Adams, New York, grew up in a Methodist home, very intelligent man, very influential in his talks, and he promoted this concept. You know, D.L. Moody promoted this concept. Another man that we've all heard of, and that is Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford was the man who wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. He was a Zionist. He went, he and his wife, after they lost their children, they went over to uh, Israel, wasn't called Israel then, Palestine, and they began to, quote, minister to the Jews that were already there. And they were so convinced that Jesus Christ was going to come back in their day to that place that they had uh, snacks and a beverage for they could serve the Messiah when he came. Um, absolutely something that is totally ridiculous. But that's what they did. Well, let's move on. Um, we're all familiar with the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was a 
a declaration in 1917 in November when British forces fought their way in fought their way into Palestine from the south Lord Arthur Balfour the British foreign secretary wrote to Lord James Rothschild a leader in the international Zionist movement and this is what he said His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best efforts to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine that would have been the Arabs or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country, unquote. In other words, the Balfour Declaration declared that the British government would help us, the Jews establish this homeland, but they were not to do anything that would prejudice the civil or religious rights of the Arabs that were already living there. Well, it didn't work out that way, did it? Um, so, Christian missionaries began to go to Israel, what is now known as Israel. But it started, the evangelical mission project started here in this country, in Chicago and different places where there was a, a great contra, uh, congregation or concentration of Jewish population. Uh, they offered sewing classes, cooking classes, singing classes, anything by means whereby they could present the gospel. And then they opened up mission, Christian missions in Palestine before 1948. Well, when we come to the 1920s and the 1930s, There were Jewish gangs that began to use a lot of violence. We've all heard of the Stern Gang. It, in 1940, Abraham Stern founded a terrorist organization. And Also, it's very interesting, in July, the Ergen Gang, under its new leader, Menachem Begin, we've all heard of him, he turned out to be one of the prime ministers, blew up a wing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem where the British Army was headquartered killing 90 people and wounding 45. But yet these futurists and these television evangelists will never mention that. But he turned out to be one of their baby dolls. He turned out to be, quote, little David that's going to set the Jewish people free. I heard this on TBN. Uh, they the TBN people, they needed to read this book. And all the other Christian television network owners, operators, staff, they need to read this book. It might change their mind.
that there was a lot of Jewish violence against the British because the British had a mandate and they were stationed there and they killed British, they killed Arabs, they killed anybody that got in their way. So was this movement of God? No. Was the Six Day War in 1967, was it a miracle like these evangelicals tell us it was? What about the uh, bombing of the USS Liberty, where 39 U.S. sailors were killed and many others wounded? And who bombed the ship? It was Israeli forces. And Mr. Johnson, that is, President Johnson, did absolutely nothing about it. In fact, he uh, covered up for it because he was, quote, in bed with the Jewish element in this country, and maybe in a physical bed too. Who knows? Um, it's been implied that that is the case. So when we come fast forward to modern times, the support that you and I have heard, you know, one on one with the television set, it's been Hal Lindsey, uh, Christianity Today. It's been the Left Behind series, which was a moneymaker interpreting Bible prophecy, but it was known to be nothing but fiction. Tim LaHaye, and he made millions of dollars off of this. And it was a series of books that millions of people bought and read it. And I hope they didn't believe it because it was nothing but fiction. And then Pat Robertson, he was pushing for this. The Jews have to go back to Palestine before the rapture or whatever his views are on the rapture. Some say that he has different, different views, which is fine. But John Hagee and this man is so off track in his theology that he wrote a book and he said that there are two plans of salvation. One plan of salvation is for the Jews. And they do not need Jesus Christ. They don't need the blood of Christ for their salvation because they get saved under the old covenant of Moses. But for the rest of us, non Jews, we need Jesus Christ. That's plan B. Have you ever heard of such heresy? Have you ever heard of such blasphemy? Now they are on this concept of building a new temple. Well, it's amazing that all these television evangelists take these tours over there, like Jerry Falwell when he was alive, and there's many others. There's a, 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 a Dr. Brown. There's uh, denominations that take groups over there. There's, and a lot of them is just for money. And these uninformed, misinformed Christians are shelling out millions upon millions of dollars 
to take tours, donate money for all types of projects. And they say, well, if you want a tree planted in a farm over there, you give us the money and we'll plant a tree in your honor in some farm over there. Any gimmick will do because the American people, especially the evangelical Christians, are uninformed, they're sentimental, and sometimes just downright simple. And they want to build a new temple. A new temple. And they say Jesus is going to reign from that temple. Christ himself is going to sit in that temple and rule and reign the whole world from that old city. And one man that used to be on television, I think he passed away during COVID, he said that he has seen all the furniture that's already made and completed, ready to be put into this new temple. But he needs to raise some money. Follow the money. And they say that the, a lot of the young men whose name is Cohen, they trace through DNA to be part of the tribe of Levi. So they're in waiting because they've been trained to sacrifice animals again. And the evangelicals of this country are supporting such nonsense. And they are sit in John Hagee's church and clap like a bunch of silly school children when he talks about this stuff. It's an abomination. It's an affront to the sacrifice of our Savior. It's an affront an absolute insult. And would you believe some of these evangelicals went so far as to believe that there has to be a red heifer as their first sac sacrifice? So, a man by the name of Clyde Lott, a Pentecostal cattleman from Canton, Mississippi, who was taken in by this silly concept, began to raise what he thought was a heifer, a red heifer, with no other color hair on its body. And there was a, I think, a, a Texas rancher did the same thing. Um, or here it says in Nebraska in 1998, he and others founded the Canaan Land Restoration of Israel Incorporated. Well, they named they came up with a, uh, a red heifer. It did not have any white hairs on it. And they named it Melanie or Melody. Melody. And all of a sudden, uh-oh, a white hair ended up on her tail. So she was disqualified. Then the Jews said, no. The red heifer has to be born over there. Now, folks, Christians are falling for this foolish, really downright stupid stuff. 
And that's why I wanted to give the book report just to show the progression, the progression of foolishness that's in the evangelical futurism world being promoted by these television evangelists. There are networks such as Daystar constantly just promoting and lifting up the Jewish people as though they were something special and in they have no need of Christ because they were of the seed of Abraham, they claim, and they have the law of Moses. So this blood sacrifice can be reinstituted for their salvation. When is the modern church going to grow up and put these men off of television? Because they are telling lies and leading many people astray while filling their pockets at the same time. And, you know, it's not my nature to call out names on these programs, but yet this is the world we live in, and I wanted to be understood as to whom I'm speaking about. Because uh, there's their influence has gone from the television and the mega churches down into the small local churches. And it's everywhere. But I want to read a scripture in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul said, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, the tradition of men. What was he referring to? He was referring to Judaism, Talmudism, and the perverted concepts of the law of Moses in all the ordinances. Or after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. You see, he is saying, if you follow the rudiments of the world, the traditions of men, and the philosophies of men, you're not following Christ. For in him, that is Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in Christ. We don't need a red heifer. In fact, do you know that there was already an animal sacrifice made in the state of Israel? I don't know if it was in Jerusalem or where it was at, but it was already made. And the evangelical, quote, Christian people were really proud of it. One woman on television has gone so goofy that she was raising money to buy uniforms for the Israeli army. How foolish. The Israeli army already has uniforms and no doubt paid for by American taxpayers. But I'm sure that some silly soul sent her some money. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New Jerusalem, coming down from God, prepared as a bride. And who was the emphasis? What is the emphasis? It's the person of Christ. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The emphasis is upon the new, not old Jerusalem, but new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, with all of its debauchery. Old Jerusalem, let me get this straight. Old Jerusalem, with all of its sin and debauchery, is known as Sodom and Egypt in the book of Revelation. Chapter number 11. Chapter number 11. Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. So, in this book that we just reviewed, gives a good overview, an excellent overview of how the modern state of Israel came about. And I would recommend for any person that is a serious Bible student and prophecy student to find this book and purchase it. We do not sell this book at Truth and History. This is my own personal copy. But I wanted to share this because this is the authoritative document to show and to give the truth about this whole Zionism movement and the evangelical involvement in it. So God help us to value truth, because Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth will not set you free unless you know it. So we give all glory to Christ and Christ alone for our salvation, not some altar, not some temple, not some red heifer, in Palestine. Not at all. Paul said we are complete in Christ, in Christ and Christ alone. God bless you.